our uh, general meeting this month. Thank you guys for coming. A um, couple of administrative things before Sarah begins. First of all, did you guys see the Golden Knights game last night? Yeah. Go Knights, go. I was there, it was an awesome game. Paid $400 for the ticket, kind of expensive, but totally worth it. Anyway. Oh, nice to be rich. Come on, Bob. Okay. Yeah, I'm also uh, cutting a lot of expenses this month, too. Okay, so. okay. okay so um, how many of you guys, everybody here has knows that we need to register our tortoises, right? Is there anybody that has not registered their tortoise? You have not, or you have? I have not. Okay, please register your tortoise, and this is why. Um, in the state of Nevada, it is legal to have a desert tortoise as a pet, and here's a weird stipulation. It doesn't really matter how many you have. Now, we are not going to adopt more than one per household, but if you or your neighbors or anybody else has multiple tortoises, we don't want those folks to not feel that they can come to us for questions. So in other words, we're not going to be the tortoise Nazis, nor are we ever going to be in the future. We want to make it clear that having a tortoise or tortoises is legal. Register them. So you can register for free on our website, no matter how many tortoises you have, and once you register them, you, they're, you're good. You're set for, for the, as long as you have your tortoise. The other reason we want to register our tortoises is because the desert tortoise sits in a weird classification of animal. It is federally listed as an endangered species, as a threatened species, which means it gets certain benefits. As a pet, it gets almost no benefits. It's kind of like having a bald eagle as a pet. Uh, you know, imagine the bureaucracy and everything that would go behind having a, a, an animal that's on the endangered species list as a pet. We kind of take it for granted here in Nevada. And over the years, it's become very, very uh, convoluted as to what the rules are for having a desert tortoise as a pet. The bottom line is that U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Clark County, the state of Nevada, United States Geological Survey, on and on and on, I can go over every single one of the acronyms of all the agencies that deal with desert tortoises, have no idea how many tortoises are pets. And the issue is, somebody please tell me why we don't want to put a pet tortoise back out in the wild. They won't survive. They won't survive, right? That's, right? Just like any other domesticated animal, they're going to have a difficult time in the wild. But even bigger is disease, yes ma'am. So our tortoises, and this is since 2015, where we've done all of our sterilization clinics, our health assessment clinics, we have seen roughly a 70, I think 73%, 70, what did flow say, like 73 to 78% chance of an individual tortoise having URTD. It's upwards of 50%, that means more likely than not, the tortoise carries uh, this disease, which is fatal to a tortoise out in the wild. Uh, upper respiratory tract disease, URTD. And the reason it's fatal to the tortoise in the wild is because they don't get water and food on a regular basis like your tortoise does. Tortoise in the wild might go for an entire year without drinking water. Having said all that, it all comes down to money and funding that is available to pet tortoises versus say a pet giraffe or a pet donkey or a pet dog or a pet cat. Without having a legitimate number and we're also sending a survey out and that is actually it got mailed this week sometimes so we're sending a survey out to 50,000 households within uh, southern Nevada and we're doing a census how many pet tortoises are in Clark County nobody knows so we're gonna find out so that's why another important reason why it's uh, important to register yes sir so is it based on like uh, she got the horse from somebody that had to get rid of them she took the horse in so is it based on Excellent question. So does registration revolve around uh, the tortoise or the owner? Um, right now we are treating we are treating it for the owner. And because a tortoise, as we all know, is going to out, if you have a tortoise, it's probably going to outlive every single one of us in this room. Um, that tortoise, we have a separate database for the tortoises, and those are linked to the various uh, custodians, I mean, who, who really owns an animal. But um, 
we don't care how you got the torts. That's not the important part. So even if it came from a registered source or an unregistered source, we are still going to treat this as a, a tortoise. And it is now, what's your name? Kristen. Kristen is now Kristen in, in a database. It would be, you know, blah, 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 your last name. Uh, and then that tortoise is now yours. If that tortoise has a microchip and was somebody else's, we can match it up and then we can say, oh, this was an existing tortoise that went off of, you know, Bill Smithers or whatever. And then Bill Smithers is no longer attached to that tortoise. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. We do suggest microchipping and we offer, great segue into my next point, um, our next microchipping clinic is going to be June 23rd. We're doing four microchipping clinics this year. The microchipping clinic is also a health assessment clinic. We did the first one in May, which is, or was it April? We did the first one in April on the southwest side of town. We're doing our next one on June 23rd on the northwest side of town at Jones Feed, Jones Feed and Supply, which is on is it Rancho and Long Mountain? Uh, yeah, kind of kitty corner to uh, Santa Fe Station. And we will offer free microchips there as well. Microchip, shell tag, and a free health assessment. Yep. Uh, the, the microchips, they obviously do cost money. It's a, but if you, can, if you want a microchip outside of the clinic, we can provide one for you too. Come to the clinic, it'll make it a whole lot easier. Yes, ma'am? Is this for a point The clinic? No, the clinic is, uh, goes from, I'm sorry, I should have said the time, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Jones Feed and Supply on June 23rd. That's a Saturday. Now, we're doing one in August, and the one in August we're doing down in Henderson. It's going to be at the Petco on Marks and Sunset. Uh, kind of, there's a Best Buy and old shopping center. That's the one we're going to do in August for the folks down in Henderson. And then in September, we're going to do one on the northeast side of town, close to Nellis. Location, I haven't, we haven't got a spot yet, but uh, the answer to your question is no, you don't need an appointment, just show up. Just show up in the front or around the back? You'll see, uh, where we're going to be in Jones Feed is going to be inside the building, kind of where they keep all their stuff, but we'll have signage to it. So you'll see signs for tortoise group and you'll see signs for registration. You just walk in, if you're carrying a tortoise, they're going to say, that way. Yes, sir. Size of your tortoise? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, what, about four inches? Six inches? From the microchip? Microchip, yeah. It's mostly dependent on the person who's doing it. It's mostly dependent on the person that's actually microchipping. Some people have more experience than others, but they do have to be about six inches in shelving. Just because the microchip itself is about the size of a grain of rice, so that's implanted into their right shoulder, so they do have to be a decent size to actually microchip them. Yeah, if you got a little hatchling, if you just got a little baby, I wouldn't worry about microchipping them just yet. But please check our website out and look at hatchling care, because what you're going to want to you're going to want to treat your baby a little bit differently than you would a grown uh, tortoise. Those guys are are uh, vulnerable to predatory animals, so. Uh, the big deal there is just make sure you have some chicken chicken wire on top to keep any type of ravens or aerial predators away. All the information is on our website, and you can you can, we'll, we can chat after after the meeting too for more specifics if you'd like. Um, any other questions concerning registration or microchips? Yes, sir. Yes, on our website. Uh, there's four categories. There's one that says, I have a tortoise, one I want a tortoise, one I found a tortoise, and one I want to volunteer. Just go to, I have a tortoise, and then it'll ask you the questions and you can register right there. Free of charge. Yep. Yes, ma'am. www.tortoisegroup.org. Yes, and we will uh, see me after the meeting and I will square you away. Uh, sometimes the website has a glitch here and there. and so We've had a couple cases where the certificate has been produced, but there's no record of the registration. And I don't know, but that's only been two, two times. Uh, I can help you through it. So we'll, we'll do it after the meeting. Any other questions about registration? Yes, sir. Is there a limit to the number? 
No, good question. That's what we were just talking about this before you came in. So for everybody that just walked in, there is no limit to the number of tortoises that you can register. Um, the law says that you're supposed to have one tortoise per adult in a household. So we interpret that. We're going to follow the law. We're not going to adopt you a tortoise if you already have a tortoise. If you don't have a tortoise, we're going to adopt you one. But if you have 17 tortoises, we're not going to take any of those tortoises from you. We want you to register them so that you can stay legal, and then we will tell you how to, we will give you advice on how to care for those 17 tortoises. Not the best thing in the world, but there are people that have multiple tortoises. And for those folks, we want to make sure that they understand exactly, you know, how to take care of these multiple tortoises. Did I answer your question? Anything else about registration? These are all great questions. Registration is a very dull and not sexy topic, but it's something we got to do. So I appreciate you guys uh, asking the questions. Um, yes, sir. Great question. Um, the short answer is no. And in fact, I texted Sarah this uh, last week and I said, uh oh, for all of our adoptions that we've been doing for the past two years, have we been actually registering these tortoises? So, um, but that's a, that is a clerical thing on our side. Everybody that's adoption, adopted tortoises, you guys have your adoption certificate. So you're registered. Everybody, you're cool. Uh, if you've gotten, if you've gotten a microchip in the past, yes, your tortoise w will be registered by the end of this month. That's a that's that's something from a clerical standpoint that we haven't filled in yet. But yes. So will you receive something? Probably not. I, I don't think I'm going to retroactively send back a registration because uh, everybody should have the adoption certificate already, and those numbers that are on the adoption certificate are going to be the exact same ones on the registration. So it, it's the exact same thing. Uh, if you just came to a clinic, we, you had to have filled out the, the actual registration itself, so that counts. It's just we haven't, I haven't put it into our system yet because we don't, we've got volunteers and none of the volunteers like to do administrative work. <laughs> Except for Diane, what am I saying? Diane does all of our administrative work. Yes, ma'am. Okay, this is kind of the same question. Rosemary just asked if uh, she went to one of our clinics, have the paperwork, and hasn't done anything with it. You don't need to do anything with it. That's, that's kind of what I was saying, is that um, from this next clinic going forward, everyone that comes through the clinic is gonna get the formal paper that says your tortoise has been registered. It looks exactly like the adoption certificate, but for everybody that has before, we're just going to put them in the system. You have the paperwork, you're good. You don't have to worry about anything else. No, it, it's not a certificate. It's not a certificate. It's just that that little piece of paper that says registered, legally adopt, blah, 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 has a tortoise's name, and then the health information on the second piece of paper. Yep, you're good. You're good. Great questions. Great questions. Anything else? So we've had a couple of successful outreach events. Uh, Sarah's gonna go over that when she gets into her talk. Um, if you are interested in volunteering, I would highly recommend this. We need help. We need help doing all sorts of stuff. We need help building burrows. Uh, anybody here had, did you, anybody here had a burrow built by Tortoise Group? Okay, and the volunteers were professional, came out, did the job. Yeah. Good experience. Absolutely. So uh, the question was, uh, you have a borough built already moving to another house, and I'm assuming in the state of Nevada? Yes. Okay. Uh, is, if it's within the Las Vegas area, then we can help you uh, move that borough. That all depends on volunteers, though. So I'm glad you kind of brought this up. For the folks that have had your boroughs built by our volunteers, um, I, would, I would offer to you that that work was done by volunteers. <laughs> And we do need help. We need help. We need uh, we need people to help with the administrative stuff. We need people to help uh, 
you dig the chat, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into this. We rely 100% on our volunteers. Joey, that's your name, right? Yeah, Joey was, uh, was at our Habitat, what, last week? I'm losing track of time, the week before. Digging out, we had a little tick issue up at the Habitat, and had to bring out all the burrows. All this stuff is very, very physical labor, so I can't hammer that point home hard enough. We do need volunteers. If you're thinking about volunteering, please see me or Sarah after the meeting. Um, that's all I got. You guys have any questions? Yes? The, okay, okay, great question too. Uh, how do you get a borough bill? What I would suggest doing is uh, just sign up for a yard consultation. Typically we ask for 20 bucks for it, but if, if you, what, I'm, I don't care about that. What I care about is making sure that you're taking care of your tortoise. So if you ask for a yard consultation, Miss Sarah Mortimer is gonna come to your house and then just walk you through exactly what needs to happen. Uh, burrow needs to face this way, the sun's going to come here, it's south facing, blah, 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 the whole nine yards, take advantage of this tree or, you know, whatever shade is there, and then tell you exactly what needs to be done. Your option is actually the best of all worlds because we don't have to provide volunteers to build the burrow. So we tell you that, but that depends on your yard itself. So that's why we need an individual yard consultation. So, um, yeah, definitely see us afterwards. Or, if you want, just go on the website and then request a yard consultation. It's pretty simple. Any other questions? Great question. Can a tortoise eat too many hollyhock uh, wow. flowers? No. 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 Right. Let them chow down. Kale. The question is adding kale to a tortoise's diet. So here's a general rule. If you walk out to Red Rock or you go to Lake Mead or any place outside of the city of Las Vegas, do you see kale growing anywhere? Okay. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. What a tortoise would naturally eat. We sell this stuff at the grassland. It's, it's basically just freeze-dried grasses. So kale is not going to hurt a tortoise, but if the tortoise just ate kale all the time. It's not as beneficial as uh, something like tortoise tortoise shower or even hollyhock flowers or rose petals or something. Yeah, okay. that's a good question. That's a good question. Yes, ma'am. So I have some plants in the yard for the tortoise. I'm going to be gone a week. Can the tortoise go Yes, 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 yes. And in fact, what uh, what we're doing right now. The food and the watering question is, is a big one that we're considering internally. Um, I, Sarah mentioned it last, last week in our last meeting and I'll, I'll mention it here. We are going to publicly announce that you probably shouldn't water your tortoise more than two or three times a month. And in terms of feeding, we're, uh, the feeding can be even less. You think about it out in the wild, your tortoise can go for months without eating anything. Now. I don't want to advocate and say we're all pet owners and we all, we feel, right? You have, you, you have your little your guy or gal and you're like, oh, I don't want to make her thirsty. But keep in mind that a tortoise is 25 million years of evolution. They actually know this a little bit better than we do. So the answer to your question is one week I believe is perfectly fine. And uh, I would even go so far as to say that multiple weeks with no watering is probably the recommended thing. but. I'm getting confirmation from several biologists, uh, several, several people that have lots of learned knowledge on the uh, academic side, some veterinarian information, and then once we get all that information, I'm going to go to my board and say, hey, you want to put out publicly that we shouldn't be watering our tortoises every single day. So uh, it's coming, and we all kind of know this, but the, the, the negative example of why we don't want to overwater a tortoise is uh, bladder stones. It seems to be... Uh, and this is me talking, this is not scientific uh, evidence whatsoever, but it seems to me anecdotally that there's a larger percentage of captive pet tortoises that have bladder stones versus wild tortoises. Now, does that mean that the wild tortoises haven't been looked for bladder stones? That's a possibility. But it also could mean that we're over 
watering our pet tortoises. And what happens is the tortoise in the wild purges. They don't drink water a lot, and when they do, they suck it all up at the same time, so they pee it all out. And have you guys ever seen a tortoise uh, when the peas with the urates come out, the pink, that pink looking stuff almost looks like blood? Okay, so that's a healthy tortoise. That is a tortoise that's pushing all its urates out. A tortoise that drinks water all the time only drinks in little tiny amounts. So it doesn't, have, it doesn't do what it naturally is supposed to do, which is push all the urates out. And those salts, I think, this is not scientific, this is my opinion right now, but I think those urates are one of the contributing factors to bladder stone. So having said all that, don't change what you're doing, but you're good for a week. It's a long answer to your question. Yep. And <laughs> yes, so everything that we have said for the past 30 some odd years, always have water available. We're sticking to that. I haven't officially changed it. I'm just letting you guys know that what, what's happening in the background. So at some point we are going to formally say, you probably don't want to have water out all the time, but don't change anything yet. I, I don't have the, the scientific proof yet to say that, but it's coming. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Introducing a new turtle. Into uh, an environment with other tortoises? Generally not a good idea. Um, we as pet owners, we anthropomorphize, right? We look at our animals and we think they're a lot like us. Uh, reptiles and specifically tortoises are fairly solitary creatures. Now, having said that, everybody has a story about somebody who has multiple tortoises and they've lived together since they were brought up and three or four boys living together never fight etc etc yes they were brought up in captivity and it's probably an anomaly typically speaking if you go out in the wild tortoises just don't hang out together they just don't they're solitary creatures they get together to make babies and then they get together to fight over territory <laughs> outside of that they really don't play cards or anything so um, uh, the, my official response to that is keep tortoises separated, don't bring them together. If you have a specific question, I, I don't want to poo-poo it. Uh, uh, we can talk a little bit off, you know, outside of this meeting and it can give you some more information, but as a general rule, it's probably not a good idea, specifically with desert tortoises. Any other question? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, you know, so I'm, like, I'm trying to help them out as well. And so I'm like, well, don't be afraid to talk to them or whatever. That's why I came to the meeting. So I'll talk about that. Okay, so if, you, if, if, uh, if anybody didn't hear that question, the, the, the question or really the statement was uh, your neighbor or friend has multiple tortoises and they're afraid to say anything. We get this all the time. It seems that the first rule of tortoise club, you don't talk about tortoise <laughs> club, right? People think they're doing something illegal or wrong. We are not the tortoise Nazis, and in fact, we offer you as the general public the ability to not ever be messed with ever again, and that is the point of the registration. So let your, tell your friends to take a look at our website. Um, the, once you register your tortoise, it's completely legal. There's nothing negative that can happen, and it doesn't matter how many tortoises you have. I want to be careful when I say that because I don't want to promote having multiple tortoises. This is when you ask the question about how does a tortoise interact with other tortoises. If you guys have multiple tortoises, cool. That's fine. We don't recommend that though. It's so, so there's a fine line there and, we, and there is no regulatory authority that is going to get anybody in trouble because there's no money for it. So the, think about it this way. There would have to be some type of organization that was chasing people with, that had multiple tortoises and the agency that that falls on is the Nevada Department of Wildlife and what they do is they push it off to the local constabulatory which is either going to be Henderson PD, North Las Vegas PD or Metro. Metro, North Las Vegas and Henderson PD have much bigger things on their plate than other tortoises. I can tell you as a matter of fact that the only time I'm aware of anything happening was in 2015, a woman in Henderson uh, confiscated her neighbor's tortoise because she didn't feel that her neighbor was taking care of the tortoise well enough. Henderson PD got involved 
and it went through and out, and everybody just said, oh, I don't want to deal with this. No, 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 no. And then the lady who took the tortoise ended up giving, what happened with that? Did she keep the tortoise? I don't even know what happened. The, the, the tor it somehow, the point is, is that nobody, there's no official organization that even wants to deal with this. So the good, I, I feel that we're in a window right now. Two, three years down the road, who knows what the law is going to be? Who knows what the political climate's going to look like? And the law might change. So as long as we can get our tortoises registered now, we're done. We don't have to worry about it ever again. I just don't foresee some type of law uh, that would that would make your registration not legal anymore. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a law. Yeah. Tell them to contact us if they have any questions. Yeah. Yes, sir. Got it. Introduction of uh, it's, I think it's called Repticow and proteins. Sarah, Sarah's, Sarah knows much about uh, diet, just the general diet question. So I'm assuming you're talking about doing this for all of your tortoises, but especially with your younger tortoise, um, you want to be careful about what supplements you're using. And um, oftentimes we see people that use Repticol or a calcium supplement, and then their tortoise starts growing at an abnormal rate. What happens is um, the scoops, the plates on the shell start getting raised up, and it causes a pyramiding effect, and it's making your tortoise grow basically like on steroids. So we do recommend um, grassland tortoise food just because it already has all of those supplements in there, as well as natural plant life and things that they would normally eat. So that's probably something you'd want to stick with. I would stay away from the Repticol and calcium supplements. What about proteins? Proteins is the same thing. Um, you want a low protein diet. So out in the wild, they're herbivores. So they have high fiber, low, pro low protein because they're strictly plant eaters. So that's what you want to try to imitate in your backyard as well. Uh, ours have taken me I, I talked with you before, and one of your tortoises eats cockroaches. And so, I mean, you, you do the best you can, because there, there's the same thing. We have issues with um, tortoises eating dog poop or dog food sometimes. Obviously, dog food, I think you can usually get out of your tortoise um, having access to it. But we have tortoises that eat dog poop that grow at, at an abnormal rate, too, because they're getting a little bit too much protein. But there's only so much you can do to prevent that. So same thing with the cockroaches. <laughs> you can't spray for it in cockroaches. Because if they eat a dead cockroach, they have to spray it. I'm not going to hurt them. Mm -hmm. But we, get, we live more, so we're getting those wild desert cockroaches. Well, the big guys. Yeah, and they love them. Yeah. Well, there's only. They are opportunistic feeders. <clears throat> so, I mean, Scott the, um, even has an amazing video of a tortoise eating part of a lizard tail that has cat had caught. So they are very opportunistic feeders. And there's only so much you can do to make sure they're doing their natural diet. So I want to eat some. Yeah, it makes sense because he's getting a lot more protein than the other guys. And then to add on to Kobe, you said talked about introducing your tortoise to the other tortoises. Also the spread of disease is a, a really large factor there. You don't want to be exposing them to the possibility of catching a disease if you already have tortoises that are in good shape and this one might be a carrier and then you spread it to all the rest of them and if it's a baby too you don't want to be putting juveniles with adults. So our last meeting we actually had a guest speaker that spoke on ticks and that's actually uploaded to our website and there's a link in that email that you could actually watch her presentation on ticks. I'm gonna cover a little bit on ticks today as well and touch on it because we've been running into issues with ticks at our habitat and we just wanna um, make sure that everyone understands how to address that issue. So yeah, we're going to cover 
current events, seasonal behavior, and what to do if you find ticks on your tortoise. So, so we're up to 20 adoptions down here in Southern Nevada, which is awesome, and we're trucking through. We had approximately 50 tortoises at our habitat when we started this season, and we're down to about 16 tortoises there. So that's really exciting. And 10 tortoises just went up to Reno. Amanda drove them up there yesterday. And so those ones will be adopted out in Reno. So now we finally are operational at our habitat again. We had an issue with ticks, so we had tortoises in different places and intake pens and quarantine pens were being used for all of our tortoises. But now we're up and operational and taking in tortoises again because we were on a little bit of a hold because we didn't have the capacity available to take in tortoises at the start of the season. So we, um, on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, we were at three different events. So Tortoise Group was really busy on Saturday. And at Las Vegas Science and Tech, approximately 14,000 people attended that event. And we had some incredible volunteers that worked that event all day and probably talk to a majority of those people. And that's awesome. And we can't do events like this without volunteers. So thank you for volunteering. And we had Petapalooza. I was out at Petapalooza and it was hot that day. <laughs> um, but Hulk was out there and he was the star of the show as most tortoises are when we go to a pet event. Everyone sees cats and dogs all the time. So when they see a tortoise, they're really excited. So he stole the show and made friends with the Doberman Rescue next door. Very cute picture. So as Kobe had mentioned, we will be having the next um, health assessment and microchipping clinic on June 23rd, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Jones Feed on Rancho. And part of that um, clinic process is a free health screening, microchip, and we can uh, apply an external shell tag on your tortoise as well, which just has your phone number, just like a dog tag, is just epoxy straight onto the tortoise shell just to help reunite you with your tortoise if it ever were to escape and someone were to find it. Same thing with the microchips. So it's always a good idea. So lately, I'm sure all of you guys have been enjoying this beautiful weather, 80s and 90s, and perfect tortoise grazing weather. They've been out and active, which is awesome, and it's a lot of fun to be spending time this time of year, but it will be warming up soon, and we'll be seeing those higher summer temperatures. So summer behavior. When, once it starts getting really, really, really hot, um, tortoises can go into periods called estivation, and they spend a lot more time in their burrows. So sometimes they won't come out to eat, and we get some worried phone calls, and I say, you know what, if you don't want to be outside, your tortoise doesn't want to be outside either. And they'll just stay in their burrow and remain inactive. So it's pretty normal for them to do this and it's a way to conserve energy. Um, basically it costs them more energy to come out, especially in those hotter temperatures, to graze and browse for food than it does for them just to remain inactive. Um, they may come out earlier in the day and in the evening to avoid those hot temperatures. And then really, really hot temperatures is what you want to be careful about. You do want to look out for anything 95 and above because those temperatures can be um, an endangerment to your tortoise. Your tortoise may overheat and signs of overheating is typically foaming at the mouth they look really lethargic, they're breathing really heavily, um, so they can be aggressively struggling or trying to dig aggressively because they're trying to escape those extreme temperatures. So especially if you built your burrow on your own, you want to make sure you're uh, monitoring the temperatures of the inside of your burrow to make sure that those aren't getting um, exceptionally high within the burrow because your tortoise needs a place to go to avoid those temperatures. Did someone say that there's uh, temperature gauge that we could get from a hardware store? Yes, so um, they do have 
these awesome infrared thermometers that you can pick up at Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, and what it is is like a little laser and you can shoot it down into it and it will take the temperature of the um, inside of your burrow, or actually your tortoise too. So actually if you just go to like Home Depot and tell them what it is you want, they will know what I'm talking about. They will know what you're talking about. If you say an infrared thermometer, they know exactly what it is. And it's about, I mean, they have them as cheap as like 10 to 15 bucks, I think. So checking your tortoise for ticks. So this one is like a crazy picture. Normally we don't see this many ticks on a tortoise. This is insane. Normally we find one or two and they're usually um, collected at the seams of the scoots. So each of these plates are called scoots and the seams is where your tortoise is growing and it's actually live tissue. So when a tick decides to feed, um, that's usually where it will attach to. Um, when it does decide to take a blood meal. Sometimes you can still find them on the skin, so I would recommend examining your tortoise, making sure that you're blowing dust off your tortoise if it's dusty like this, and just making sure that you're going along the seams. And then what I typically will do is kind of rotate the tortoise and check inside of the limbs um, and the head area and the tail area because they still can collect um, underneath the shell and in, within the limb area. Um, see, so even here it's really difficult to see them actually. Um, they're right underneath the shell, right by the cloaca. So you do want to make sure you're checking um, every little crevice because that's where all the ticks can go. Now, in order to remove ticks, what I would recommend doing is using a soft toothbrush. They usually come up off pretty easily, and then um, just brushing them off into a bucket with leech and hot water, um, or you can use tweezers too to pick them off. Um, some of them can be very, very small, like the, si like the size of the head of a pencil, so you do want to be paying attention for that. There are larger ones as well that are bigger than that, about like a millimeter. So, um, so other animals can be carriers of these ticks, but it's not a typical dog tick. So not like a deer tick or a hard tick. These are soft ticks um, and mostly found in the Southwest um, United States. Um, they typically are not a harm to humans or other animals. Um, they're not, they don't really pose that much of a threat to tortoises either. Um, they can carry tick, what is it, relapse? Tick-borne tick -borne relapsing fever, where you would get sick and then you'd feel okay and then you'd get sick again and feel okay. Um, a lot of times when people do come down with that, they don't even realize that it is tick-borne relapsing fever and they just go get treated with antibiotics. So there's really not been very many reports of it even. So where are they getting these from? So the ticks ask, act as nesting bugs. So they um, are just like bed bugs and they latch onto a host and then the host will transport them from burrow to burrow. They like dark, cool spaces. So part of our issue with um, ticks at the habitat is we don't always find them on tortoises unless they're feeding because they stay in the burrow. So we had to dig up all the burrows and expose them to sunlight because they like the dark, cool spaces. So your tortoise would have to be around the forest That is correct. Um, but keep in mind too, especially since you live out in a rural area, um, other animals can be hosts that carry these ticks. So lizards can pick them up and take them into a burrow and take them out of a burrow. Um, Typically, if your tortoise hasn't been exposed to ticks, it's pretty rare that you would be finding them on the, your tortoise, but it is still something that you want to pay attention for and just do an external examination. Just a precaution. Can you use vinegar instead of bleach? You can. Just, I just try to use like, vinegar when I clean everything. I think vinegar would still suffice. You're not putting the no, 
you just use, yeah, it's just the bucket of water, bleach, yeah, just to kill the ticks. Yeah, so you just use a dry toothbrush and brush them off into the bucket. Yeah. <laughs> and that's pretty much all I have. If you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer anything. One of my guys disappeared for a bunch of them. I worry about it. But somebody I talked to was talking about having a camera that we could get at, at, on Amazon. And I, I don't know what I'm looking at. I'm looking to see if anybody disappeared. So, um, the question is, uh, actually I know exactly who you're talking about, Les and Kim were here last yeah. meeting and they were talking about how they have a camera extension that plugs into their phone that goes into their burrow. Um, they do make those and they do make them pretty cheap. They have expensive ones too. They're called an endoscope or, yeah, so E-N-D-O-S-C-O-P-E. -E. I can restore that for you too. Or a, bo a boroscope. Scope. B O R O S C O P E. Endo. E N D O S O P E. And they actually make these really cool extensions that plug right into an iPad, uh, your cell phone, and it's just like a plumber snake that you, it's like semi flexible and you can stick it into your burrow and see within it. Um, they had mentioned that it doesn't take super great pictures, but... Uh. I just want to know they're there. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I have a couple of questions. When they're small, they're small enough to be able to save So typically when you have a juvenile or a hatchling, we typically recommend starting off with like a smaller habitat, you're still going to imitate everything you would be doing in a larger habitat, but on a smaller scale. So you still want areas of sun and shade. Typically what I do with a hatching habitat is um, you pretty much make one side of the habitat the wet side and one side the dry side. Dry side is where your burrow is, wet side is where your plants are to make sure that your burrow staying nice and dry. Um, and then typically, in order to protect from predators, people will cover those habitats with chicken wire to keep cats out, to keep birds out, and anything that might be able to snatch up a smaller tortoise. Okay, that's good. Um, and then you've got a tortoise that's not super interested in the habitat, and It is okay if he's eating plants and grasses. Um, some tortoises can be a little stubborn when it comes to eating the grassland tortoise food, and I actually get this um, comment quite a bit from people that, oh, my tortoise doesn't like it. We have yet to have one tortoise that won't eat it that comes through the habitat. So I think that people humanize our tortoises a little bit too much, and if they don't eat every single day, then they panic. Um, keep in mind, tortoises don't really eat on a daily basis out in the wild, so um, most people are overfeeding their tortoises. Um, but if you do have stuff that they are eating, what you can do is try to mix it in with the grassland to promote them to eat the grassland. It can be a little bit trickier with juveniles or hatchlings. A lot of the hatchlings that come through are really stubborn when it comes to eating the grassland. So I would just try try your best to implement that. And you don't have to do it on a daily basis. I would probably only offer grassland three times a week. And you you can, I mean, we try to imitate what they're doing out in the wild as best we can, so, you know, natural desert dirt would be the best thing, but um, something that's similar to that works as well. And when we're placing a tortoise in someone's backyard, we work with whatever they have, typically. Um, they do sell it on Amazon.com. I'm not quite sure of anywhere else except for to order it online. Okay, good question. So she asked, how can you tell if your desert tortoise has a bladder stone? 
which we do see bladder stones in desert tortoises, and um, it does pop up. The only 100% way to know if your tortoise has a bladder stone would be for you to have it x-rayed. And I know Tortoise Group used to recommend having them x-rayed every five years. Not everyone can afford that. Part of our health screening at the clinics does involve palpating. So what um, the biologists do is a little leg massage um, and stick their fingers up into the shell and rock the tortoise back and forth to try to feel for a mass. That's not a 100% way to check, but it does, I, I've, um, we've just had two tortoises that came into the habitat that I could feel masses on both of them. So um, it does typically have to be a sizable mass to be able to feel it, and we do want to catch it as soon as possible, but that's not always an option when we have a tortoise come in. Um, a true desert tortoise, yeah, it sounds like. <laughs> be that concerned about that because we you do want to hydrate it because they do intake water from the plants that they eat so that's what that's imitating because those are dried plants anyways um, but maybe to promote him have you soaked your tortoise this season yet when he first came out, I soaked them. so typically when we soak them they'll do a nice flush because they're purging on water but I guess you've got a stubborn one that just doesn't want to drink so should I just take him to my regular you can, yeah. Um, and I won't worry. It'll put your worries away. <laughs> you can definitely take it to the vet and they'll be able to x ray it for you. Yeah. Uh, we do have a list of vets that see tortoises on our website. Um, we typically take our tortoises from the habitat. Um, we have two doctors from Creature Comforts go out and do an initial screening when a tortoise comes into our habitat. Um, also, we typically will take our tortoises to Lone Mountain Animal Hospital or Creature Comforts for surgeries and um, treatments. So, Mike's, uh, so just with the, the hot months coming up in some further burrow, how much do you recommend like insulation on top of the burrow to keep them at a comfortable temperature? So you want about a put of dirt on top of your burrow to provide proper insulation. Another thing to take into consideration is the direction your burrow is facing. So the entrance, you don't want have you don't want to have the hot summer sun in the afternoon shining directly into your burrow and warming it up in the middle of summer. Um, and then typically, sometimes we run into issues too when people put them right next to the wall because concrete walls can absorb so much heat in the summertime <coughs> that sometimes it offsets the inside of the temperature of the burrow. And my second part, uh, you mentioned something about soaking after they come out from the So um, typically we recommend soaking right when they come out of brumation and right when they go into brumation. And typically when we pick up a tortoise, we soak them as well just because we don't know when was the last time they had access to water. Um, especially if a tortoise was found, who knows how long it's been wandering around without any access to water. Um, typically, in order to soak them, what you do is just take like a Rubbermaid bin or something that um, you can collect water in, and that's big enough to hold your tortoise, and then fill it up with like lukewarm water halfway up the tortoise's shell so that the tortoise can still raise its head above water if it so chooses. A lot of times they will submerge their head underwater and intake a bunch of water through their nose and their mouth, and they'll stay underwater for quite a bit of time. But oftentimes when they soak and they purge on that water, they um, also flush their systems out. But you also don't want to be soaking your tortoises a bunch of times either. Just typically we recommend right when they come out of brumation and right when they go into brumation. If it's really hot outside, sometimes people will do it then too, just to cool them down. Typical soak time. In the summertime? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, 15 to 30 minutes. I mean, some tortoises kind of seem like they like soaking, and some of them like don't want to have anything to do with it and just want to crawl out of that bin. But I would probably leave them in there for about 15 minutes. My tortoise is calcium he starts moving around. Yeah, yep. So yeah, just like Susan. Yeah, just like she said, I mean, sometimes they just start moving around like crazy and you just take them out. They're done. Yeah, how long do they to be outside down for? Um, so hatchlings flip over quite a bit. Um, it really depends on the outside temperature. Um, a lot of hatchlings can typically right themselves, not always, but if it's a really, really hot day, then you don't really have that much time to flip them back over. And that goes with adult tortoises too. So it really depends on the time of year and the outside temperatures. But even a tortoise flipping over, sometimes they'll vomit and choke on their vomit and not make it. Or a lot of times they void their bladders and it's still creating a lot of pressure on their lungs to be flipped on their backs. Some tortoises are really uh, stubborn like that. Like I said, it, it really depends on outside temperature. If it's 100 degrees out, it's only going to last, you know, a few minutes out there because it's it can't move to control its body temperature. Um, if it's a nicer day, then I've had people say that their tortoise was flipped over for several hours. So it really just depends. <laughs> there you go. Brumation? Yeah. Okay, so bruma brumation is the reptilian form of hibernation. Oh. Very similar. They remain inactive from um, mid October to mid March, um, but the only difference is um, they don't use utilize the same mechanisms. So they don't like like a bear gains double weight and then loses half of that over hibernation. Um, tortoises don't do that. They just decrease their heart rates and just kind of go inactive. So um, we actually do have two different designs. We have an above ground and an underground one. And sometimes people will even do partials. So that's really up to you if you wanted to dig down into the ground and then cover it back up, or if you wanted to just rest it on top of ground level and then basically build the hill around it. Either way, you just want to make sure you're providing enough insulation, which would just require about a, a foot of dirt on top of there. So with hatchlings, we typically will use roof tiles, and then with adult-sized tortoises, we use a wooden burrow frame. Um, we actually have a volunteer that builds them. He's very handy and does hours and hours of work for us. Um, that one is much larger, and it's um, set to accommodate any size tortoise basically. I've had, it's rare that I have to have a customized burrow because that entranceway is 14 inches and then there's ways to customize it for smaller tortoises. We just add um, 2 by 10s to the side and then they're pulled out as the tortoise grows. What, what size is a, a tortoise no longer considered a juvenile? So typically I would say about um, what when they're not considered a juvenile anymore is when they're eat, um, when they're reaching sexual maturity, which is six to eight inches in shell length. So she says sometimes while she's watering her plants, her tortoises will walk through the sprinklers and get wet. Is it a problem for the shell to be wet? No, a lot of tortoises tend to like to hang out in the sprinklers and like to make little mud puddles. Um, as long as they're not remaining in water, I, I don't think that that's an issue because they probably dry out pretty quickly. So um, it's the cost of materials, so the wooden burrow frame itself is $60 and each additional grow board is $10. Any other questions? I have people interested in adopting, but they don't, they live in an apartment, they can't talk to them, right? 
Yeah, they do have to have a yard in order to adopt. They can volunteer though and come hang out with tortoises. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you all for coming today and joining us. I know it was a little bit earlier and I'm glad to see so many faces, especially with 95 closed down. <laughs> Did we change the time for a reason? If oh, it's because uh, the bruise is kind of affected. Just for this week. It's just this month. There's another event going on today. Registration, 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 registration. All of you register your tortoises. <laughs> We can take him. <laughs> I will be back there to sell it. All right. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.